Great. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. I will say this is a little odd not seeing people in the audience and getting feedback. Um, but you know, we'll, we'll interact over the chat in a little bit. Um, this might be the first talk that you're seeing on Newman, although uh, likely not. I know we have a bunch of talks on Newman at the conference. Um, I'll go over what Newman is a little bit uh, throughout the talk. And in particular, um, let me just go through here. Hi, that's me. I'm Kevin Swiber. I'm a solutions engineer here at Postman. Uh, what that role means is that I engage with folks um, who are looking to use Postman and who have already started to implement Postman uh, and kind of help them work it into their API lifecycle, um, their software development lifecycle in some cases. Um, so we're going to take just a, a brief little history break here to talk about how we actually got here, why we use pipelines today. Uh, and then I'll go over some common strategies for how people are working uh, testing into their CI CD strategies with Postman. I'll spend some time going over uh, some a, a new strategy that I've been playing around with uh, to see if that resonates with you and, and perhaps could help you out. And then we'll wrap it up and do some Q&A. All right, so how did we even get here? Um, so if you've been around for a while, then you know, you've know you gone through several iterations of, of how we deliver software uh, as, as, a, as a, a group of technologists, right? So um, you know, it, it used to be that uh, you know, version control like, kind of still works today as, as it always has. Our, um, our abilities to, to come in and start manipulating those controls and, and you know, um, getting really deep in how we uh, can, can interact with different versions has certainly increased. But for the most part, we've had a centralized repository that people are committing to and pulling back from over time um, and then trying to figure out what to do with it from there. So you know, there was a point in time, if you can believe it, where um, services weren't necessarily one of our main deployment units. So, um, you know, if you're if you're an embedded engineer, if you're working uh, on embedded systems today, then you still have to deal with some of this, right? You have to uh, build your software, you have to deploy it to a physical system, you have to run tests on that physical sy system, uh, which is actually where we get the term smoke test, right? If uh, the piece of hardware starts smoking, then clearly something is wrong. Um, so you know, we've um, Going through the late 90s, uh, if you were around, you probably deployed software using FTP. Uh, so if you were, if you had a, a web host that you were using, you could uh, you know FTP your your CGI files, your PHP files, whatever they might be, your HTML files over to that web host, and then see that go live. Uh, maybe you used um, Secure Copy SCP to to transfer over Unix Linux based systems, um, or XCopy if you're if you're a Windows fan and you've been using Windows for a while. Um, so that, that's kind of where we're coming from. Things have certainly changed. Um, uh, you might be familiar with uh, extreme programming. You can tell how old this is by looking at the style of the book cover. Um, it's been around for a little while now with you know, some practices that were kind of refined in the 90s and then in the, the early 2000s a little bit more. Um, you know, some folks started taking a look at our software delivery processes and saying, uh, you know, clearly business is benefiting from a rapid pace, from competition coming out, challenging us to deliver faster. Uh, and if we have to deliver faster, how do we do it um, with more confidence? How do we do it in such a way that we are minimally breaking things and also providing value, right? Which kind of sounds like the holy grail. Um, and you know, there, there are definitely some practices that, that they came up with. So um, this gets us to about 2001, the lodge at the Snowbird Ski Resort uh, in Utah, I think. So we're, we're actually coming up on about the 20 year anniversary of the Agile Manifesto. Uh, so one of the practices that came out of that movement uh, was continuous integration. So uh, we're all committing to some kind of centralized repository each commit that I make, I want to ensure the quality of that version of the software, right? So, um, you know, you're probably doing some amount of CI today. So through um, through automated unit tests at, at the bare minimum, uh, which is, is kind of where all this started. 
Um, you know, from unit tests, we get up to integration tests, and, and of course, that expands uh, even, even way beyond that. Uh, to help facilitate all of this, uh, one of the earliest CI systems out there was called Cruise Control. Um, I'm curious if anyone's ever used that other than me. Um, and Cruise Control would do just this, right? It would automatically pull down the latest version of that code on your commits. Uh, it would run your test suites, and then, of course, send alerts if something was broken. Um, and then your whole team would get mad, or um, breakage became so common that nobody cared about the CI system anymore. I think we're, we're hopefully past that point. Uh, so you know, one of the interesting things here uh, is that like we started to, to realize, at least on the development side, that we all kind of need to be unified, uh, especially in development, in testing. Um, we need to have these short feedback loops uh, because the short feedback loops means we can iterate faster. It means we can evolve faster. We learn more quicker and can therefore adapt. Um, it has taken a very long time for that mindset to extend all the way out to ops, to operations, to how we deliver the software, to how we maintain those systems. Um, and you know, this, a lot of this has taken off with the, the DevOps movement. So um, you'll start to see things about continuous testing, uh, testing in production becoming a big thing. There was just a really great talk here at the conference on that. Um, you know, and, and this is where we start to get into concepts such as continuous delivery or continuous deployment. Uh, and so, again, we've got you know a bunch of uh, a bunch of tools happening in that space as well. Um, through the course of this this kind of DevOps movement, we are starting to get a little bit more unified. Um, there's there's plenty of good work out there right now um, describing some best practices in this area. Uh, we can talk a, a little bit about you know some of those um, references as well. So I mentioned all the tools in this space. There just there are so many. So I think there are nine here on the list, um, and you're you're probably using one of these, um, if not multiple. Uh, how many folks are are saying today, like, oh yeah, we have a bunch of stuff in Azure pipelines or you know in GitLab, uh, but we still have some Jenkins server just kind of hanging out in the back that's running you know five or ten of our our projects. Um, so you know Jenkins was kind of an early player in this space. Uh, and and is still around. So, um, you know, but but it's really interesting to see how many more of of these these names are, are coming up. Um, and as things start moving to the cloud, of course, or continue moving to the cloud, we see uh, infrastructure providers providing all sorts of services around this as well. Um, so one interesting thing about managing all of this infrastructure. Uh, and, and managing all of this automation um, is, is folks eventually say, okay, well, you know, something like Postman has these cloud-hosted assets. What danger am I bringing to my automation by depending on these cloud-hosted assets? Um, and what's really interesting is, is when we hit this kind of, of objection or roadblock, it doesn't take much to realize that we're already depending on the cloud-hosted assets. So, um, you know, how many folks have their CI CD servers running in uh, AWS or, um, you know, Google Cloud or Azure already? Um, tons, right? Well, we are already depending on these cloud-hosted assets. And this is a trend that's not going away. It's only going to continue. Um, and, and so part of this is, you know, is vendors offering some kind of solution for running locally, um, or at least the, the execution of it happening locally. Uh, and we see this across all sorts of tooling. So um, AWS Lambda, Heroku, uh, and Postman as well. Great, so now that we know how we got here, uh, I'd like to start talking about some ways that people start integrating uh, Postman test into their pipelines today. And there are, are really two main strategies that folks use. Um, first, we're going to talk a little bit about um, what this actually looks like in the product uh, and what Newman is. So uh, if you've used Postman, uh, and you know Postman can be used for a number of different things, but if you've run workflows through Postman, uh, if you're running test suites in Postman, you probably uh, have some experience with the collection runner. So the collection runner will take all the requests in a collection and run through each of them. It'll execute all the tests that are associated with these requests. And you get a report like you see here on the left-hand side saying these tests have passed, these tests have failed. 
uh, and then you can dive deeper from there. Newman takes that experience to infrastructure that you can manage. So Newman is uh, an open source CLI that we have that you can run, you can give it a collection, you can give it an environment, um, which can be exported uh, as, as JSON, uh, it can be accessed in a couple of different ways. You feed those to Newman, Newman will run through that, that test run and give you a test report on the back end. Um, so there are a number of different reporters that you can use with Newman. By default, you have the CLI reporter, which gives you a nice printout in your terminal. Um, JUnit is very popular for integrating with systems like Jenkins that can automatically render that as HTML and give you some kind of experience over those results. Um, and then we have HTML emoji train for some reason. It's fun, I guess. You know, it, it gives you uh, sort of smiles and heart eyes when things pass. But this is also an extensible part of Newman. So if you have some kind of custom format that you want, if you want to take your test report and turn it into some beautiful ASCII art that you want to share with your team, you can absolutely do that um, just by creating a, a reporter, an external reporter, and using that with Newman. Um, so the first common way, and some of this kind of tracks with the progression of Postman as, as a tool and the features within Postman, the most common way people start using Newman uh, is to actually export their collections and export their environments. Um, so collections and environments can get represented in essentially a big blob of JSON. Um, and what folks will do is they'll commit this to their repository. Uh, they'll, they'll have their CI CD system start using Newman to run against the collections and environments that are stored in their repository. And there, there are a few issues with this that we'll get into. The second common way is to get it directly from the API. So a difference here is that um, you know, with the, the collection uh, export, you're, you're using whatever was exported at that point in time. Fetching it from the Postman API will give you the live version of that. So you can do that with, um, with collections, with environments, um, and a number of our different assets. But as it pertains to, to Newman, those are the two main ones that you would use. So there are some pitfalls uh, with this. So uh, checking in those assets, maintaining those collection IDs, depending on, on which variation you're using, can become difficult over time. It's difficult to keep that stuff in sync. Uh, we have an editing experience that's living inside of the Postman application. Um, and how do we reconcile that with our automation system? Um, if you're doing, if you're storing your collections and environments inside of your repository, how do you actually version those over time? Those become very difficult to version um, because you you get a diff of giant JSON blobs, right? You don't get a, a nice semantic diff like you can get inside of, of of Postman. You don't get that with you know your your GitHub or your GitLab or your your local system diff tools. Um, and then, of course, managing these assets over time for multiple versions of an API, for multiple APIs, uh, can become a very difficult thing to do as well. Um, so, you know, we've uh, we've recently been improving on the API entity inside of Postman, and this opens up a, a few different avenues for us when it comes to to asset management. So that's something we'll actually be taking a look at. Okay, I'm gonna go over um, a demo. Uh, I'm not gonna get into sort of all of the details of how it works, but um, I will hit on a few things that are workflow, workflow related uh, that could be really beneficial to your organization, especially if you're dealing with some of these problems already. Uh, I mentioned about these, um, you know, these common strategies that folks are already utilizing. Uh, and I stole the idea from my colleague Joyce about having a large pink cursor, so hopefully that is very visible. Um, let me head over to the Postman app. I'll zoom in a bit here because I know this the hop-in screen is a bit small. Uh, so if we take just quickly just take a look at the API entity inside of Postman, we can see what it offers. Um, so an API inside of Postman uh, has versions associated with it. Um, each of those versions has the ability to associate various assets to it. So um, documentation, environments, uh, mock servers, various test suites, um, monitors. 
and uh, uh, an API schema of some kind. So uh, most commonly, we are seeing open API in here. Um, and while the open API stuff does open up uh, a few more features, like being able to generate collections from it, that's not necessarily something that we're going to focus on today, at least for the purposes of the asset management piece that we want around testing. Um, so one common issue that we see um, if we look at tests is that uh, if we're pulling this directly from the API, um, if we're, we're pulling our, our test collection directly from the API as we're running Newman in our, our CI CD pipeline. Um, how do we ensure that uh, we're only getting the changes that are ready for that environment? Um, there are a, a few different things to do there. Uh, inside of, of Postman, you have the ability to fork any one of these collections um, and have sort of gated change with pull requests back into them. Uh, but even after that, you know, when, when do you actually mark your collection and say, okay, now it has all the changes necessary to actually be used inside of that automation. Um, once we have that association to the API, so I've added a, a, you know, this collection as a test suite to our API version here, um, and our version is called staging, uh, you can actually come into the, uh, the collection if you hit the collection name here in our, our new uh, V8 app you'll see this context bar on the right-hand side. And if you hit this uh, history looking icon here, you'll get a change log. And so in this change log, you're actually able to come through. Uh, let me see if I can get a better view of that. You're actually able to come through uh, and add a version tag to, to these snapshots in time. And so this becomes important. This becomes significant uh, to, to your workflow. So. Uh, to give a, a demonstration of um, you know, how that might get reflected in your workflow. Um, I'm actually going to use a, a chat bot to, to interact with a, a Jenkins server on the back end. So let's let's hope that that works out okay. Uh, let me bump up the font here. Uh, so say we, we've got smoke tests, we want them, we want them to run in staging. Um, we actually have some, some labeling conventions that I'm applying to a lot of the names here. So we'll see that I'm, I'm grouping uh, this collection with smoke. Um, if we look at our develop tab, we see that we have an environment uh, that's associated with it using this sort of grouping label. Um, if we look at our versions, we see that there is a, a branch associated with this version. Uh, and if we look at the name, uh, we see this ID of, of learner API. So, uh, essentially, what I'm doing here is building automation that's looking at these various labels and making decisions on running um, running those tests in our CI CD server. So um, when I deploy, it's going to look for uh, you know this this particular API that's running. It's going to look for a a branch that matches the branch I have. In this case, it's a deployment branch for staging. Um, and I'm going to to tell it in my automation that I want to run a suite of tests that are associated with that. So. Uh, if we run this, let's see, bot's name is Astro. Uh, please deploy Earner API, which is our, our API, uh, the main branch to staging. Looks like Astro has replied here. I'll make this a little bit bigger. Uh, so we see that Astro is actually deploying this. And again, as, as part of this deployment, it's going to run through a series of tests. It's going to pick up that automation. Um, it's going to, to find the right tests to run, and it's going to run them. I want to get a, a gateway timeout. Thanks, Jenkins. Uh, looks like it's still running. I do have this little indicator up here that it's still running. Uh, but we'll get the, the last results manually here. Match the last build of our API uh, deploy staging. All right, so when we get the last results here, we see that we have one failed test uh, out of eight. So we'll get those results. Uh, please fetch the last, oops, spell that right, the last. Uh, or the Postman test reports for the last build 
of Earner API deploy staging. Right. This might look a little weird because we have to zoom in so much, but um, we see that we actually get the test reports back here. Uh, and so um, based on, again, these, these IDs, uh, we're able to, to say, okay, we want to run contract tests for this particular branch um, in this particular repo. We want to run integration tests. So we see that those two have passed. Um, and then we want to run smoke test after it's deployed to staging. And we see that we have one failure here. So we can go take a look at that. Um, and in our results, we see it's uh, inside the get data request. Um, response time is less than two seconds is the name of the test. It expected, well, this is kind of reversed, but uh, it expected 259 to be below two. So that looks a little weird to me. Um, so I'll hop back to Postman and take a look at our smoke test. Get data was, was the one. And we'll look at our test just to make sure the tests are right. Um, and here I could tell that that there is an issue happening because this is actually supposed to be in milliseconds, not seconds. So if we do that and we save that um, and head back over to our overview screen here, look at our change log. Again, let me move this over. Um, our change log is helpful. We can actually go back and see like, you know, who made this change. Um, and just, you know, like about every time I figure out who broke the build, it ends up being me. Um, no big surprise there. Uh, but we can come here and see the changes that we've made. Um, let me see here. Oh, up here. Uh, so we can see that we changed it from 2 to, to 2,000 there, which is great. Uh, and then we can come over here and we can say, so we can play around with this right now, right? It's not going to impact our build at all. We can add new changes. We can take in forks. We can merge pull requests. In this case, we'll say we're we're finally done. Uh, we'll label it. Uh, we'll select the version of staging, um, add it as a test suite. We'll add that version tag. Uh, and now that we've done that, we'll try deploying one more time. Maybe I'll just do a copy and paste up here. Oh, this is returning a little bit too early, I think. It's okay. Just just bot stuff. Just bot stuff. Oh, no, no, no. That's got the wrong one. Here we go. I'll do Astro. Please deploy Learner API staging. Oh, main. There we go. That one should work. Okay, so we've submitted again. And again, it's going gonna, it's gonna to run through that automation find the right tests. Um, and now it's going to find, of course, that snapshot in time that we've tagged uh, as being, you know, as belonging to that particular version of the API. Um, so good, we're, we're finally running. Hopefully we don't get another 504 error through a, a gateway timeout here. And we'll actually see it complete. Should be just a, a few more seconds because I actually did wire this up to, to really do a deployment. And of course, making builds go faster is a kind of a whole practice worth doing here as well. I can see my builds taking a little bit longer, but here we go. So um, you can see that we've made that change. We've run the tests, uh, and we can we can grab those test reports again. Please fetch the test, the Postman test reports for the last build of. Earner API deploy staging. All right, and we'll look at the smoke test here again and see that those have all passed. Right. So I'm happy to, to talk with folks after this too if you know you want more details on how to wire up something like this in your own system. Uh, but we can see that you know a workflow like this can be super beneficial to managing assets that um, have an editing experience inside of Postman versus um, through other avenues that you know you might be using today. Let me hop back to my presentation here. Um, we'll do that. Great.
great. So just to, to start wrapping up a little bit, um, and then we should have just a minute for some Q&A. Um, this kind of automation ends up being super important, right? Uh, and to, to really do this well, you need tons of testing, of course, um, but some observability in addition to that. So um, I certainly recommend, uh, you know, we're moving into a place where we're observing all of our running systems. Um, that should apply to your CI, CD systems as well. So monitor what's happening in Jenkins uh, or, you know, whatever your CI, CD, CD system is. Uh, get notified when things start running slower. Um, definitely practice on making those things faster. Um, and, and take a more systematic approach to this. Really start investigating it um, would be my recommendation here. So, um, you know, I've actually spent a lot of time in, in process development and process design. I've worked in uh, the manufacturing industry, actually, on, on designing process for assembly lines. Uh, and so things like lean manufacturing have a lot of really important lessons that can be learned for just about any process. Um, one of the things we measure is, is lead time. So, you know, how long does something uh, wait before the next step occurs? Um, the good news is that, um, you know, this kind of thing is a lot easier to manage or to measure on the product delivery side than it is on the product development side. So it ends up being kind of low hanging fruit to, to go uh, just pick any build cycle that you do. Um, it doesn't really matter because most of the, the problems are gonna end up being the same between all of your builds. So just pick one, start mapping out uh, what that flow looks like. Um, look into value stream mapping, a lot of good information around that. Um, I do recommend a book. Um, called Accelerate by uh, Dr. Nicole Forsgren, uh, Jess Humble, and Jean Kim uh, to take a look at and, and get more info on how to start designing these things. Um, and lastly, you know, building automation uh, can sometimes feel like a really difficult thing, right? So initially we start with the pain of it not being automated. Um, and then we get kind of excited by thinking that we can go through, automate it and get some improvement. Uh, and then, of course, we realize that the problem might be actually bigger than we thought, um, that we have to tackle a lot. And so we have to go through the process of breaking down the work, figuring out what's more important, um, treating it like normal software development uh, or planning around software development. Uh, and, you know, the thing is, like, once you start chipping away at this, the value that you get out of it um, is is so tremendous. So it might feel like a big upfront cost initially to get all this automation in place. But once it's moving, once it's flowing, uh, and and developers are, are freer to, to focus only on those problems that are actually impacting the business, your speed to value really starts to increase. Um, so, you know, it might seem like, oh, Maybe it's not a big deal if I stick with one of these, these other methods of, of running my Postman tests inside of my pipeline. And for a lot of folks, yeah, it's probably fine that you're doing that. Um, but you are leaving some room for improvement on the table. So you are um, leaving some value there that's worth taking a look at. Um, again, happy to answer more questions around this. I'll be around the conference, um, around the Postman booth for a while. And you can always reach me on Twitter at Kevin Swiber. Um, thank you very much for coming to my talk. I appreciate it. And if um, you're left with one thing, um, it should be to, to go grab Newman and start playing around with running your own tests on your own systems. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Kevin. That was awesome. Everybody, if you love that, hit that high five in the bottom right. Let us know uh, if that was helpful for you. We had a couple questions here. I don't know, Kevin, if you want to stick around here and sure. answer a couple. Um, I did see one. Michael Gregg was hoping we could drop that book you recommended into the chat. Uh, looks like we've got a couple of uh, requests for that. So let's go ahead and do that. So I don't have a link right now. I can probably go find one real quick. But uh, that is the name of the book. And then let's go over to the Q&A. It looks like we've got a bunch of good questions in here. We're going to start with the top. And if you see any questions in here that you like or you were going to ask, go ahead and just hit up, uh, hit the update on that. Um, see a couple requests for the book. So I think we handled that one. Uh, the top question here is, how long did it take up to set up Astra? Oh, <laughs> the bot. Um, not too long, actually. Um, you know, I, I used a, a Slack framework called Bolt uh, that made it pretty quick. So 
Um, if you are integrating only with Slack for your bot, I would recommend using Bolt over something like Qbot, um, because Bolt will support all the latest features in Slack, uh, and so you get more nice things. Um, but not too long, a day, day and a half. OK. Let's move to a uh, kind of the focus centric here. So we've got one here from Julian. Is there a way to view the status of deploys in Postman? Um, so there's not a way for you to view the status of your deployments in Postman today. We are experimenting with having deeper integrations into CI CD platforms. Uh, so you know, we looked at that API builder tab earlier and the different tests in there. We are investigating ways to get uh, build delivery information back to that screen. So you can take a look and say, for this particular environment, uh, did this particular test run and pass? Um, so th there's that. Um, and there's also the opportunity to use monitors for a lot of this that we didn't really talk about. So a monitor is something that will run on Postman infrastructure. It'll execute a collection against a particular environment. You can put the, the Postman data centers on your allow list to allow it to access internal environments like staging or beta. Um, and you can get alerting based on that as well. All right. Um, let's see. Vincent's got a great question here. Um, and I don't know if you want to hop in there and read it too, but it, uh, Sure. I just remarked the change log, uh, but looks like only available on the collection. The idea to get it through each test. Yeah, so the change log is going to be available for the whole collection. So um, if you go and uh, you know update a query param, you'll see that in the change log. Um, <clears throat> so when a collection is associated uh, to an API or an API version, that unlocks the ability to do the tagging. Um, so at that point, you can go in there and start tagging your resources. Um, and that opens up some things in the Postman API. So I'm using the Postman API to kind of you know, traverse this graph of, of our assets. Uh, and you're able to do things like say, uh, I want the, um, the staging version associated with this API, and I want the integration tests associated with the staging version. And if you have those tagged, you'll get that snapshot in time through the API. Um, so whatever the tagged version was at that point, you can grab that snapshot and then execute that code. Okay, we'll take one or two more. I saw in the main chat, Himto uh, asked, can Postman test connect with the database to do API versus database validation? Only if that database has an exposed HTTP endpoint that you can connect to. So the only protocol that uh, Postman can really speak right now is HTTP. Uh, and that's, you know, of course, through the normal request interface as well as through pre-request and test scripts. Um, so, yeah, we are looking at uh, multi-protocol support going into the future. Um, so if you have ideas and thoughts around that, those would be good to share uh, with the Postman team, either through our GitHub account um, or support channel or, or community forum, whatever channel that you have. Okay, let's see. Let's take... Uh... One or two more. This one should be quick. GitLab Postman integration. When? Um, integration to what degree? So uh, I think we'll, we'll do collection backups to GitLab today. Um, but as far as like integrating with the pipeline support inside of um, GitLab, I don't believe that's there today. Okay. Uh, but again, it'll it'll be kind of on our as we continue going down integrations and and trying to improve our integrations. It'll be included. Um, in our, our review of that. Okay, and this one, last one, um, especially let's end it on something not so on topic, but Kitty asked, would you still recommend the Extreme Programming book today or do you uh, recommend a new alternative for it? Yeah, so I mean, I, I like Extreme Programming. I like, um, you know, I've, I've been, I've read a lot about various different uh, agile methodologies. I think there's something good to take from, from all of them. Um, in general, I tend to say that, you know, we should probably be treating Agile uh, as a set of tools that we um, smartly apply to whatever our situation is. Every situation is, is completely different. So Extreme Programming has some really great thoughts in it um, around pair programming, <clears throat> continuous integration, feedback loops they talk about. Um, <clears throat> so definitely still worth reading. Um, and, you know, a lot of those people who, who were involved in the early movement are still publishing works on it today. So <clears throat> Pardon me. Definitely worth taking a look at, at what they've said since that book. Awesome. All right. Well, I think I think we can close it here. Kevin, thank you so much. I think thank you killed you. it. If you guys, if y'all think you killed it, 
smash that high five. Um, I think we're, we've been saying it. That's how we're going to get our bonuses at the end of this year is how many high fives we got on these just three days. Um, but yeah, thanks so much. Again, if you have more questions, you can follow up uh, with anyone here on the conference at the booth and we'll be available and you can connect with us outside of this. Uh, thanks so much again, Kevin. Thanks everyone. Yeah. I'm gonna hop thanks off. everyone.